Right, moving on in our unit on causation. So this, this lecture is about Mackey's account of causation, J.L. Mackey, kind of early 20th century philosopher. Uh, we read a piece by Jaiguan Kim, um, Korean philosopher, because he's, the Mackey is hard. It's, it's buried in this huge book. I can't make you read the whole book. Um, I thought Kim had a nice sort of summary account of, of what's going on in Mackey and some analysis as well. So we'll recall J.S. Mill, right, defined the cause of some event or state or whatever, why, as a set of individually necessary and jointly sufficient events, states, etc., X, that invariably precede Y. So um, it's going to be a big set of stuff, right? All so you know the cause of a match lighting is going to include the striking of the match, but it's also going to include the presence of oxygen and maybe even, you know, the orbit of the Earth, all the things that have to right, work for it to start. So all this, not only sort of the stuff we usually think of causes that, that are immediately, temporarily, like, prior to the event, but all the stuff that just has to be in place since forever in order for anything to work. Right? So Mill gets a little mushy with the proceeds. He seems to say, well, it, the cause doesn't necessarily have to precede the effect. Um, and so instead of invariably proceeds, you might say invariably produces, right? Or invariably entails or something. You don't want to be using produces as just another way of saying cause, because we're trying to define cause, right? So we can't use the word cause in our definition of cause. Um, maybe it's a kind of logical entailment. Um, if that's what he's trying to do is reduce, right? Causal relations to a kind of logical relation. Um, he's not super clear about it. Um, Mackey will have, and we, we saw the problem, the main problem with Mill is the enormity of causes. It seems it's just this huge, probably infinite set of things, and it doesn't really match up with our intuitions about what causes are. We usually think of a singular cause, and then also in scientific practice, we like to isolate, you know, particular causes. We don't, so that we can, you know, like, think of a law of nature Right, all x's are y's. If the x, if the cause part is going to include, is going to be an infinite set, uh, it, it's hard to formulate laws of nature that way. So it would be nice if we could narrow it down a bit. So Mackey's going to try to narrow it down for us a bit. And Mackey's going to say that a cause is an insufficient but necessary part of a condition which is itself unnecessary but sufficient for the result, which is. Uh, abbreviated as INUS. I'm not sure how he pronounces it because I've only ever read it. Um, if you Google it, you get Inus the dog. It's kind of funny, but right, Inus condition, Inus condition. Okay, so what does this mean? Right, that's sort of a, a long, complicated thing, an insufficient but necessary part of an unnecessary but sufficient uh, condition. What does that mean? Okay, so let's take an example. A short circuit, right? In an electrical short, right? And we'll say that that caused the house fire, right? If your, you know, insurance company comes or, uh, you know, the cops or something, they're going to try to isolate the cause and they might say, oh, the cause of this fire was a short circuit. Um, but that short circuit is neither necessary nor sufficient for the fire, right? Why isn't it necessary? Well, there's all kinds of ways your house could catch on fire. Um, there could be a different short circuit, there could be a leaky gas line, there could be a pile of oily rags, and so on, right? So short circuit causing a house fire um, is not to say it causes it, is not to say it's necessary for the condition, um, nor is it to say that it's sufficient, right? Because you can have short circuits without having a fire, right? As long as if there's no flammable material near it, that's the whole point of junction boxes, right? That's a little box there. Is like in case there's a short circuit, it's contained in that box and it's not going to spread. So in every in our everyday sort of intuitive sense, we say, yeah, the short circuit is the cause of the fire, but in what sense, right? It's neither necessary nor sufficient for the fire. Well, like Mill, Mackey does agree that there's a, a big set of necessary conditions, right? And some of them are negative conditions, some of them are positive conditions. You remember the distinction between negative and positive. Negative conditions are just sort of um, stuff that that can't, that should not happen. And it's not happening is, is, is part of the cause, right? So if I drop my phone and 
nothing runs to catch it, well, then it will hit the ground. And so I can say my dropping the phone caused it to hit the ground. And part of that story is the negative condition of no one stopping running in to catch it, right? So that's what negative conditions are. So all of those are included in, in a set. There is a set of necessary conditions. And that set is jointly sufficient for the house fire. And that was Mill's account. So Mackey agrees that that's part of it, right? And the short circuit is going to be in that set of necessary conditions. Um, and it's also going to include the flammable material, right? A lack of a sprinkler system. That would be a negative condition and so on. So that's the IN part of the in. So the short circuit is insufficient, right? Because there's lots of other ways. I'm sorry. It's insufficient because you need more than just the short circuit, right? There has to be the whole set of conditions. Um, but it's necessary. It's a necessary condition. So insufficient but necessary. Um, the U.S. part is that that whole set is itself unnecessary because there's lots of other ways fire could start, but it is sufficient, right? If you have that whole set of conditions, a fire will start, right? If you've ruled out all the negative things and the sprinkler system and all that, you will get a fire. You're guaranteed a fire. So they kind of all, Mackey and, and um, Mill kind of agree on all the factors that are there. The difference is that Mill identifies the cause um, with the entire set, right? And Mackey wants to single out one of those conditions within the set, short circuit. So the problem is, is, is narrowing down. So we, right, we have this big set and, and Mackey wants to say, there's one thing in that big set of necessary conditions that is the cause. But which one, right? How do we pick out the right one? Because there's a lot of a lot of things that will satisfy that in this condition. The presence of oxygen is an insufficient but necessary condition, right, for the fire, and it's in a big set that is itself unnecessary but sufficient, right? Um, so, you know, an ambient temperature of above zero degrees Kelvin, you're not going to get any fires if, if things are at absolute zero, right, and so on. So how do we single out the short circuit and not, for example, the presence of oxygen? So Mackey does this by introducing a new notion, which he calls a causal field. So you take all the set of all the sets of jointly sufficient conditions for the fire, right? So short circuits or oily rags or whatever, right? All the sets of things that would be sufficient for a fire. Um, the gas, you know, one would include a gas leak and all of those sets are going to contain oxygen. Right? You need oxygen for a fire. So even if a spark starts it or the oily rag start it or a gas leak starts it, fire is going to be in all those sets of necessary conditions for the fire, right? So that means that oxygen is part of the causal field. Part of the causal field is not going to be a candidate for the cause of the fire. Um, but the short circuit is not going to appear in all of the sets, right? Because some of the sets, you know, won't, one of the fires might one of the sets that could cause a fire might be a pile of oily rags and a match and there's no short circuit at all so anything that's in all those sets is going to be in the causal field and that's not a candidate for the single cause okay so <clears throat> that's how we get a single cause right we acknowledge this huge set but we say some of the things in that set are always going to be there to produce a fire right and so we can safely ignore those as part of the causal field. And if you ignore all those, then, so he claims, um, you'll be able to isolate one particular cause. Right? So Mackey is a kind of regularity theorist, right? He's just sort of refining human Mill's accounts um, to sort of accord with our everyday notion of causation. So he's still saying, right, that a cause is something that invariably precedes something else, right? But to make it invariable, we had to get into all this machinery with Mill and then and then Mackey refining it, right? But it's still a regularity account. It's just regular succession is what a cause is, right? Um, so by necessary and sufficient, he just means always proceeds. But he manages to get the kind of regularity Hume couldn't, right? The fact that the problem is not all short circuits cause fires, right? Mill fixed that but he had to fix it with an enormous cause, right? Um, and so Mackey sort of whittles down the enormous cause by ignoring all the ones that are part of the causal field, right? And now we get a regularity theory of causation that can pick out a single cause and does get 
invariable, right? It's it, it it's in, invariably causes. So cool, right? Very cool. Of course, there's problems. There's always problems with these accounts, right? So we can look at some of those now. But hopefully the account makes sense, right? And the appeal of it makes sense. You get the regularity theory. You don't have to worry about something extra and mysterious being the cause. Um, and we don't have to worry about um, all those problems that we saw before, right? So one problem is Mackey's, it's supposedly a regularity account, but it actually relies on a counterfactual analysis of causation, which is a whole different kind of analysis of causation. We're going to see that later with Lewis, right? So what does that mean? Why is he relying on counterfactuals when he's supposed to be a regularity theorist? Well, uh, consider the case of a storm, right? So the cause of the storm, we want to say, is a drop in atmospheric pressure. Right? And there's a regularity there. Storms regularly follow drops in atmospheric pressure. Now, it also so happens that my barometer reading, right, if I have a barometer, that also drops regularly before storms. After all, that's its point. It measures atmospheric um, pressure. So there's a regularity there, but we certainly don't want to say that the barometer reading causes the storm, right, just because it invariably precedes the storm. Now, the Innes condition deals with this problem, right, because the barometer reading is not one of, is not a necessary condition for the storm, right? The story would have the storm would have happened anyway. Um, but you might get two types of events that go very so tightly, right, that we can't understand the lack of necessity in terms of regularity, right? There are things that always occur together, um, and so what we do in those cases, right? So think I don't know, uh, night following day and things like that, right? Um, in our world, those always occur together. So in order to peel those apart, you have to understand necessity in terms of counterfactuals. If the barometer reading hadn't occurred, the storm still would have occurred, right? Um, even if in our experience, the barometer reading always occurs. Now, barometers do break sometimes. So in our experience, it's not a, it's not a perfect regularity between barometer readings and storms. But again, the night and day thing is a sort of a perfect regularity. I'd like it not to be the case that night causes day, Right. Um, and so you'd have to uh, you'd have to use counterfactuals to say, well, if there was another sun or if we had bright floodlights. Right. Or if the sun exploded or something. Right. Um, there are circumstances where night wouldn't follow. Um, OK. So. The point being, right, he's a regular theorist, but he does have to when two things correlate really tightly all the time and one's a cause and one is not, um, we have to find a way to say that one is the cause and one isn't. And the, the only way he can do that is to say, well, in a counterfactual situation, right, something that hasn't ever occurred but could occur, those one would happen without the other, right? Um, and in doing that, uh, He's going to have to analyze counterfactuals in some other way. The regularities we'll see an account that does it in terms of possible worlds in the next lecture. Um, but when you do that, you're giving up on a pure regularity theory of causation. So uh, he fixes regularity theory by kind of giving up on it a little bit and, and also using. Other problems for Mackey. So sometimes effects are overdetermined, right? So imagine a person who's hit by two bullets simultaneously. Um, neither one of those bullets would be a necessary condition for that person's death, right? Because if the one bullet didn't kill them, the other bullet would, right? But that means that neither bullet qualifies as an innocent condition because neither is necessary. But surely at least one of the bullets caused his death or both or something, right? Um, you could try to say that both bullets together are the necessary condition, but that's obviously not true, right? Only one of them would have, one of them would have been sufficient, right? Um, so that's a that's a situation where a cause is overdetermined, sort of by simultaneous things. Um, and there are other cases of overdetermination that aren't simultaneous, right? So even if the person was hit by two bullets in succession. Um, neither one turns out to be the necessary condition since if the first bullet hadn't killed them the second bullet would, right and again we'd want to be able to say that one of the bullets is the cause clearly he was killed by the bullets but because it's overdetermined you can't see either is necessary and so it doesn't qualify as an innocent 
another problem is unrepeatability, right? So and this, this is a problem for Mill as well. So if Mill and Mackey are correct that a cause can only be picked out against this background of a huge number of causal factors, then it seems like unlikely that that same set of factors would ever occur more than once, right? Any given event, you know, there's all these particularities that caused it, right, and made it inevitable, um, but that particular set uh, won't be the same for some other event, some other similar event, some other house fire, right? Um, but we would like causation to be a law-like relation, right, where we can say, X is cause Y's, right? We don't want to say that every single house fire has a completely different cause, right? And we, there's no laws, right, governing fires. Um, but the mill mackey sort of causes only seem to qualify as causal factors for one particular event with a particular set of background. So we could say this electrical short caused this fire. That's great. I mean, that's something, right? But we can't say that electrical shorts cause fires more generally on their account. And I, used to, I think that would be a kind of a law-like relation, right? So I don't know, you could try to get out of it. You could try to weaken what we mean by electrical shorts cause fires to a probabilistic relation, say electrical shorts usually cause fires. Um, but that's not actually not even true, right? Most electrical shorts don't cause fires because most houses these days are built to code and the shorts in a, a proper box and it doesn't cause a fire, right? So the law, law-like relation would have to be something like electrical shorts of sufficient intensity near a sufficient amount of flammable material usually cause fires or always cause fires. Um, so there's just a tension between how strict the law can be and then how large the set of factors that you have to bring in. And, you know, in the worst case, you get back to the enormity of mill type causes in order to have any kind of law-like relation. Uh, that's no good. Okay, so finally, and this should be a, a relatively short lecture, right? Uh, we noted that Mackey, in order to deal with sort of factors, causal factors that are tightly correlated, where one of them is a causal factor and one is not, it's just correlated with the causal factor. Um, when there's that amount of regularity, you have to use counterfactuals to pull them apart, right? Um, you know, if the barometer had broken, then the storm would have still would have happened or something like that, right? If the sun had blown up, then night, uh, then day wouldn't have followed night. Um, but referring to things that didn't happen, but could have, right? Uh, we can certainly pry apart the causal things from the other uh, correlated things. Um, but then you might say, why bother with the regularities at all, right? Uh, let's look at these counterfactuals and see how just how far we could get with those on their own, right? And that's exactly what David Lewis is going to do in the next lecture.